In early Western philosophy, it was Plato who set the pace, but the ultra-methodical Aristotle soon challenged him for first place. Born 40 years after Plato, he marked out his very own turf, less of a head-in-the-clouds idealist, far more down-to-earth. His impact and his range and reach are hard to overstate. He even squeezed in teaching Alexander the Great. His approach was so grounded he effectively founded scientific method as we know it today. He invented formal logic and had plenty more to say on chemistry, physics, history, ethics, politics, poetics, botany, biology, astronomy, theology, rhetoric, zoology. In his epistemology or theory of knowledge, he said facts should lead the way. He analysed existence, oh, and how to write a play. So, in any overview of the works of Aristotle, it sadly must be true that an irksome, awful lot'll be left out. Brought up in Macedonia, dad the doctor to the king, Aristotle set upon his quest to study everything by heading off to Athens at the age of 17, to Plato's academy, where the brightest would convene to question, listen, learn, debate with intellectual heavyweights, hypothesise and contemplate. Can knowledge really be innate? How do the stars move in the sky? What makes a man's life good? And why? Twenty years of conversation, disputation, deliberation with Plato. That's an education. While disciplines like geometry and algebra were taught, many days at the academy were spent in abstract thought. No tutor of philosophy is all-knowing and all-wise. The greatest lesson they can teach? How to philosophize. So Plato and his students used to kick around ideas, regardless of the age gap, be it 10 or 50 years. And while picking holes in Plato's thinking must have taken bottle, it helped to shape the rigour in the works of Aristotle. For instance, the theory of perfect forms that Plato cultivated, for Aristotle simply made life overcomplicated. To agree on a general idea of a bed or a bone or a dog, there are plenty of examples all around to catalogue. Who needs a different world of ideals that may well not exist? We can construct what makes a dog from an earthbound list. This contrast in their attitudes is illustrated well in the School of Athens fresco, the work of Raphael, which he completed in the Vatican in 1511 showing Plato pointing skywards, his mind clearly on the heavens, and Aristotle next to him, palm faced towards the ground, while Socrates is arguing with anyone around. To quote Aristotle from a later seminar, Plato's forms have no more meaning than singing la-la-la. Likewise, on his attitude to scientific proof, he said, while Plato is a friend to me, a dearer friend is truth which, with minor adaptation, Isaac Newton came to use when his first law of motion clashed with Aristotle's views. Newton wrote in Latin, in a margin, his own spoof. Plato is my friend, Aristotle is my friend, but now my dearer friend is truth. For Plato, the soul was immortal, but Aristotle suspected the worst, that when we die, that's it, goodbye. Either way, Plato found out first. The Academy's loss and a brand new boss was Aristotle's cue to leave the groves of Athens and discover pastures new. Travelling round the Aegean Sea, Aristotle took the chance to collect and dissect more than 500 insects, creatures, plants, observing and noting with dogged perseverance their qualities and properties based not just on appearance but other brand new categories he chose to introduce, like bloodless animals, those that suckle, and how they reproduce. Distinguishing, describing, dividing, subdividing, an application of organisation to nature in all its diversification, Aristotelian classification. With his great chain of being, he laid out a detailed plan in ascending order, rocks, plants, insects, animals, man. 
stolen later by theologians who thought he was wrong to stop, as above humankind they placed angels and then put God on the top. Yet critical thinking had turned a new corner with his approach to flora and fauna. Hierarchies, groups, sorting nature in this way, inspired the taxonomy that is still in use today. Aristotle married. Soon they had a daughter. But then came a call from across the water. The king of Macedonia said, You must educate my son Alexander, not yet the great. What did Aristotle do to help young Alexander turn from bolshy teenager to fearsome war commander? It's one of those stories from ancient history where evidence is scarce, so the truth remains a mystery. His influence on the adolescent empire-building hero was immense for some, but for Bertrand Russell, zero, as he couldn't see the link between a calm, reflective thinker and a callous, brutal, egocentric, very heavy drinker. What does it matter what books your tutor used to put on your shelf? If every time you name a city, you name it after yourself. On balance, it's probably fair to say the desire to always have things your way will be in the son of a king's DNA. Though amongst all the kills, analytical skills will help you be lord of all you survey. We do know that they stayed in touch, as just a few years later, while Alexander was away, becoming even greater, from every land he conquered, by peaceful means or bloody, he'd send new plants and creatures for his ex-tutor to study. Meanwhile, returning to Athens, Aristotle founded a college, dedicated to research as well as general knowledge. The Lyceum is why in France today some institutes are called lycée, though few are run Aristotle's way, as in his Lyceum's colonnaded cool walked and talked the scholars of the peripatetic school under the democracy of elected student rule. Aristotle wrote a lot, so now he'd be annoyed at just how much of it's been lost or carelessly destroyed. What we call the works of Aristotle are his lecture notes, essays, scrolls and bits of scroll, plus some random quotes. Yet so many terms we use today sprang out of what he wrote. Induction, demonstration, substance, energy, dynamic, universal, proposition, essence, category, topic. And one more incredible breakthrough from his work in natural science, while sorting things into categories using questions of compliance, Aristotle saw what no one had before. When seeing if a plant or creature fits in with the norm, the analysis required is logical in form. If all feathered creatures are birds, and this creature here is feathered, this creature here must be a bird, there's no doubt whatsoever. Formal logic, free of confusion. Premise 1, premise 2. By deduction, a conclusion. The syllogism, a seemingly simple formula, and yet we owe its creation to all those hours Aristotle spent on classification. Plus, when he saw the connection, that flash of inspiration. If every A is a B and C is an A, it follows that C must be a B. Or, to put it another way, if all men are mortal and Socrates is a man, Socrates is mortal. Deny that if you can. Building on the syllogism, Aristotle brought an entire system of logic to the world of rational thought, an intellectual discipline that cannot be ignored if you want to get to grips with an argument that's flawed. It could even be said of Alexander's tutor that his step-by-step -step processing helped lead to the computer. As for metaphysics, well, we wouldn't have that word were it not for Aristotle, though the reason is absurd. It's because some centuries later, scholars sorting through his texts had finished a book called Physics, then had to name the next. The book after the one about physics, as titles go, is pretty weak, but they went and called it Metaphysics, as meta means after in Greek. Aristotle's Metaphysics asks a question that persists. What exactly do we mean when we say a thing exists, as it's nowhere near precise enough to know it merely by the stuff of which the thing consists?
For instance, what we call a house isn't bricks in a random pile. A house is bricks in a structure, formed in a certain style. Or, to view this metaphysical tangle from a slightly different angle, what do we mean by a human being? It's an ever-evolving creature. From the day you were born you may keep your name, but your body is certainly not the same. What makes you you, when physical change is a constant ongoing feature? Aristotle named four causes to help get us out of this hole. A thing is defined when these are combined. What is it made of? What is its shape? How is it made? And what is its goal? Typically, he labelled each cause to make them identifiable. Material cause, formal cause, efficient cause, and final. The final cause, goal or telos, can be simple or hard to tell. The telos of an axe is clearly to cut, so a good axe will cut well. But what, asks Aristotle, is a human's final cause? If our lives all have a purpose, what is the point of yours? His answer to this was eudaimonia, whose meaning he admitted was not very clear. Eudaimonia means happiness, flourishing, living well, which for some could mean a saintly life, for others raising hell. Beyond the practical requirements that everyone needs to meet, a roof above our heads and a course enough to eat, the telos of human existence, Aristotle firmly believed, lies in self-expression, in full potential achieved. Which is why he recommended if we want to reach our peak, we need to make the most of what makes human beings unique. Basic physical pleasure is what all animals enjoy. But reason is a rare treasure only humans can deploy. The state of eudaimonia is one we're far more likely to find if we make the choice to engage in life with an active, agile mind. And although on one level he seems to suggest a philosopher's life is simply the best, what Aristotle's giving is a broader guide to living, a plan for everyday improvement in everyone's routine. With an attitude towards self-help, he called the golden mean. What the world will throw at us is impossible to tell. The best we can be is somebody who responds to challenges well. Living is more than a matter of principles and rules. It's a constant carving of character, using the right tools. Bad behaviour, bad character, grow from the choices we make into vices which harden by habit, which for our own good we should break. Good behaviour, good character, grow from the choices we make. If we reach out for virtue and grab it, that's by far the best course we can take. So how do we recognise virtue? Via the golden mean. Take two related vices and the virtue lies somewhere between. Generosity is the mean between profligacy and stinginess. Courage is the mean between recklessness and cowardice. Self-respect is there to be found between self-abasement and vanity. And wit lies somewhere on the line between boorishness and inanity. Never too little never too much. The golden mean can keep you in touch with your own personality and guide you through the art of sensing the right feeling, playing the right part. Eudaimonia is an ever-changing state, an attitude to living that's for us to cultivate, an ongoing project, a monitoring of the self, to live in tune with reason, to track your own mental health. So if you're looking for an easy life, Aristotle's words are a bummer. To be happy takes a full lifetime, as one swallow does not make a summer. In Aristotle's politics, the question he chose to explore was the one that many have asked ever since. What exactly is government for? What is the telos, or goal, of the state? Aristotle had an idea. It's the job of politicians to provide the best conditions for their citizens' pursuit of eudaimonia. Eudaimonia for everyone. Nice slogan. Easier said than done. Man is by nature a political animal, Aristotle's well-known quotation, reflects his insistence a worthwhile existence cannot be in isolation. 
due to our interdependence and social inclination to live in communities, towns and cities, we gain through cooperation. But the communal diktats of Plato's Republic were not the way to go. At the prospect of sharing wives, children, property, Aristotle said no. If eudaimonia is all about being the best you can be, the ideal state should facilitate self-improvement through legal decree. To enable the people to live their lives in the best possible way, every law should promote public good and guard against moral decay. A self-centred life can be tempting, so all of us need to be steered and helped to see that good citizenship is a key to eudaimonia. Aristotle's politics helped kickstart the debate about the individual and the role of the state. How much is it the government's job to tell people what to do? Do political animals need to be trained or tamed as if in a zoo? People and institutions tend to form an uneasy alliance. So how do we see that society thrives while ensuring the human spirit survives? Politics shapes every part of our lives which is why for Aristotle, it is the master science. Then the news hit Athens. Alexander is dead, and politics raised a far uglier head. As Macedonian sympathies went quickly out of style, Aristotle was charged and about to go on trial, but with his life at stake and a jury to appease, he recalled how they'd executed Socrates, so quite sensibly he fled, based on the thought he'd rather spare an Athenian court another opportunity to sin against philosophy. From Athens he sailed to the island of Euboea, where he died at 62 the following year. By general consent, roughly 30% is all that we've discovered of Aristotle's prose. What else did he cover? Heaven only knows. His critical gaze even falls on plays, where one of his favourite shows is Oedipus Rex, where the critic reflects on the purging effects of catharsis on the audience as they witness all the king's woes. Aristotle was also the first to point out that a good plot will depend on having a beginning and a middle and an end, and his notes on heightening drama through discovery and reversal should really be read by more writers before plays get to rehearsal. Aristotle left his mark on Western civilization in so many ways you could even say he defies classification creating whole new disciplines with his insightful contributions, structuring logic, mapping out happiness, constantly seeking solutions, systematising biology, introducing so much terminology. His differences with Plato, young player versus coach, drew philosophy's battle lines on methods of approach. Knowledge that's a priori, before we and the world interact, versus a posteriori, after we've gathered some facts. Platonic or Aristotelian? A rivalry set to resume between rationalists like Descartes and empiricists like Hume. A jack of all trades and master of plenty. Dubbed the philosopher by Conoscenti, he even makes a guest appearance in Dante's Inferno, where of all the great thinkers, Dante calls him the maestro. A high-performance intellect, running at full throttle. Has there ever been a mind machine quite like Aristotle?